Hey, didn't see you there. It's been a while since I posted a video and I thought, hey, I haven't really talked about 2019 movies yet. And it is 2020 and it is February, but you know what? People are still talking about those movies. Do you know why? Because the 2020 Oscars are coming uh, February 9th, I believe. Yeah, February 9th. And a lot of people are talking about these movies that have been nominated and there is one particular movie that has been nominated several times, much more than I think it deserves. It's not even on my top 10, by the way. Now the Oscars and the Academy Awards themselves, they don't necessarily define what we consider as cinema, um, but I think that they are a good way to kind of gauge and kind of garner interest for movies that have come out or uh, for people who don't necessarily go see movies every week like I try to do. Uh, it gives interest to in movies that should have eyes on them. So, you know, the Academy Awards, as shitty as they can be, there's some good that comes out of it. So anyways guys, I wanted to talk about some of the movies that I really enjoyed out of 2019. I think that there were some spectacular movies that came out, some incredible filmmakers that debuted, um, debuted, debut, arrived, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, they are here and they're making great films and not that 2018 was a lackluster year, I, I hold some of those movies dearly to my heart, um, but there are some movies that this year kind of just pushed the boundaries of filmmaking a little bit further. And for me, I think that this is one of the best years of movies that I've seen in a while. Um, but no, not to stroke 2019's ego or anything like that. I just want to get into some of the movies that I didn't get to see. Uh, like the title suggests, this is a top 10, but obviously there's a lot of movies that are not on this list and there are also movies that I wish made my list, but they just got squeezed out. And that's the thing with the top 10, you can't necessarily fit everything in there, because there's 10. <coughs> now some of these are movies that I didn't get to see or didn't get to catch and it's a little bit disappointing because I really wanted to make time uh, to go out and watch these movies, but then there's this dilemma of you're an AMC Stubbs member, but at the same time you don't really live close to an AMC. I mean, you don't live far, but it's kind of at this distance where by the time you get to the theater and you get out, it's already 10 p.m. or 11 p.m., then you gotta go to bed, and basically you spend your whole day getting to the theater and watching a movie, and there's other things you want to squeeze in there. This is a very specific experience, I'm talking about mine. Um, so who gives a fuck? Now before I get into my top 10, I want to talk about some movies that I didn't necessarily get to see. Um, and it's a little bit disappointing because a lot of these movies are limited release or they just had a small run in certain independent theaters that are kind of out of my distance. Um, so it's a shame that I didn't get to see them and I really wanted to. And to be honest, I feel like they might have made my top 10 list, but it just didn't happen. You know, the stars didn't align or whatever. But I'm reading them out now and I'm definitely going to try to catch them this year. Um, a lot of them are probably going to be mentioned either during the Academy Awards or they've been mentioned in past awards. Um, so I mean, you've heard the buzz and you've heard about them and if you were lucky enough to see any of them, I please, I please, please send me a recommendation, tell me how you thought about it. and. If you're not watching this video, then you're not going to get this message, but please let me know uh, what you thought about those movies and let me know if it's worth seeing. I mean, either way, I'm going to try to catch it, but like I said, I did not forget about these movies. Um, they're probably gems. So I'm going to read off this list and then I'm going to get into my honorable mentions and then I'm going to start rolling into my top 10 and then the video is going to conclude and then you're going to go back to your lives and everything's going to be normal again. So let's do it. So there's about 60 movies I didn't get to catch, so I'm just going to read them off. Uh, the Beach Bum, Arctic, Midsummer, The Art of Self-Defense, Crawl, Good Boys, Hustlers, Honey Boy, Little Women, uh, Just Mercy, Missing Link, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, The Two Popes, Portrait of a Lady on Fire, Richard Jewell, and Bombshell. Now I know what you're saying, some of these movies are on Netflix, so what is your excuse, Brandon? Well, here's my excuse.
So those are the movies that I didn't get to catch. Now onto my honorable mentions. Now I got about six honorable mentions and I know these numbers are kind of weird. 16, six, uh, we're kind of used to like five, tens. Don't we kind of do that? No, I mean, there's no structure here. These are just numbers. There are about five movies on this list of honorable mentions. And like I said, they didn't quite get on my list, but I really wish I did. You know, you could just do a top 15 and squeeze them in, but 15 is just such a bulky number. And not a lot of people like that. So 10 keeps it clean, keeps it nice, keeps it friendly. So the first movie that I think deserves to be on people's top 10 list, but didn't quite make mine, was Rocket Man. Rocket Man was a movie. Feeling empty. I could hear the whole tune in my head. It was all there, I could see all the notes, and I just had to get it out. It's a little bit funny. This feeling inside. Now, I actually did a review of Rocket Man, and this was a very fun experience because not often do I get to push my mom into the theaters and watch a movie with me, but I think it was a really fun experience. Taron Edgerton and Dexter Fletcher are both magnificent. Uh, Dexter Fletcher being the director, it's not like he's in the movie, but you can see the way that he directs this film and you can see that he has uh, a knack for doing musicals and a knack for directing music and directing big dance numbers. And it's just such a pleasure to watch. Taron Edgerton in this, he not only is just a great singer and a great performer, but you really feel like he understands the character and you feel like he has this close relationship with Elton John, which I believe he does outside of the movie. And I think that kind of feeds this interest of this character and how deep he goes into it. And I think that if an actor is able to sing in his own voice and embody the character in that way, I think you feel a stronger connection, which is probably why Bohemian Rhapsody starring Rami Malek as Freddie Mercury didn't quite hit home with everyone, besides the director being sort of a creep. Um, there are other things about that movie that kind of make it feel like they didn't quite get the character, they didn't quite understand the band, they feel a little bit one-sided in terms of the narrative for that movie. But this movie feels clean, this movie feels like such a, such a trip, um, and, and not in a way where it's wonky or weird or disjointed, but everything flows and all the dance numbers flow into each other and it truly is a musical. And it's not just your classic, typical, um, biopic it feels like there was effort it feels like there was more and it feels like what Freddie Mercury wanted for his film to be um, rest in peace but he wanted himself to be interesting he wanted people to remember him um, as someone that wasn't just kind of boring anything you like with my music my image my life anything but never make me boring and this movie does a great job of taking Elton John and making him one of the most fascinating characters brought to screen. Um, so respect to both artists, Freddie Mercury and Elton John, but in terms of both of these movies and how similar they are in terms of structure, uh, this one wins out. And I know it's not even in the same year, but no competition. Rocket Man is spectacular. A shy little boy you were. <laughs> Look at you now. Now the next movie is Shazam. You've run from foster homes in six counties. I can take care of myself. When you're 18, give these people a chance. Because that's what they're giving you. You know, like a big comic book action film starring uh, Zachary Levi as a man-child. Now you would think, oh, man, these are just, you know, standard comic book movies. You know exactly what to expect. But this movie goes into areas where it feels like you're watching a superhero film from the early 2000s where there is a heavy emphasis on heroism. There's a heavy emphasis on this childlike nature and finding out and discovering your powers where it doesn't feel like you're watching it for the sake of you know, just shutting out and just watching mindless action for two hours. It feels like you're watching a really warm story about a boy who's discovering how to let other people in and how to forgive himself and forgive others. And it's a really deep, touching story. Uh, 
inside of this DC movie and I think it's a movie that is kind of underrated and possibly underlooked because it happened to come out uh, I think in April of 2019 so it happened early in the year and a lot of the movies that come out all these summer releases come out and everyone has this new interest for all these other movies and they kind of get shut off um, but this movie definitely deserves to be pushed up on some people's lists if you are a fan of comic book movies I feel like this is really refreshing I really like the family elements and themes in it I I think the villain is serviceable, sure, but I think there's some moments in there that add some personality and they actually give him a backstory, which is really interesting. Um, and you get to see some familiar faces and you get to see a pretty diverse cast and it's pretty refreshing, I don't know. Uh, overall, it just gave me warm feelings and it's around Christmas time. You would think this movie's directed by Shane Black, but it's David Bot. David by. It's directed by David S. Sandberg, a guy who's known for horror, and there's some elements in this movie that feel like you're watching a horror film, but you're watching it through this kind of whimsical lens, kind of like you're watching a Sam Raimi film. And because it has that edge to it, it makes the movie a lot more interesting and it elevates all the concepts in it. Um, so yeah, Shazam. Oh hey, what's up? I'm a superhero. Now this next movie is The Resurgence of Eddie Murphy. It's this performance driven film where you get to see him do his comedic stuff, but you also get to see him uh, reach into his dramatic parts inside of him. Whoa, that sounds weird. He gets to show his dramatic chops. That's a way better way to say that. Whatever I said before, just forget I said that. Don't tell anyone. Hey, you know, Auntie, I was thinking about putting out a comedy record. Comedy? You've been a singer, a shake dancer. Ha! It's real hard to break in. I do whatever it takes to get in. I come up with a new character. Dolomite is my name, and fucking up motherfuckers is my game. Dolomite is my name is a movie that was released on Netflix. It's a movie that I think is going to be completely underlooked uh, for the past year. I know there's a lot of people talking about it on social media. There's a huge thing about Eddie Murphy's back. Uh, Eddie Murphy has. Um, finally begun to come out of his Norbit phase and into this new world of hey maybe I can do drama hey maybe I can do just more than just comedy maybe I can be both funny and dramatic and it's really really great to see and especially the cast of this movie is incredible you get to see so many of these characters come together and meet each other and it's like just the story of this guy who's collecting all these people around him and not because he's he's rich or anything, but because he has a dream, because he has a vision, uh, because he wants more out of his life, because he feels like he wasn't given those opportunities. So he made it happen himself. He literally willed it into existence. And it's so compelling to watch, and I'm building it up to sound like it's some kind of HBO drama, but it really isn't. It's really funny, it's really lighthearted. Um, it's about a real person, Rudy Ray Moore, a man who kind of pushed uh, buttons in the black exploitation era of film and not necessarily push buttons but he found the levity in it he found the humor in it and he dialed it up to 11 and he's a person who rest in peace his soul that was known for being raunchy and his comedy wasn't necessarily recognized until he started putting out movies till he started putting out these comedy albums that were just just gross and um, <laughs> and not what people were expecting at that time. Uh, but looking back, it's like, wow, the comedy that we see today, it's just become so different from what people were willing to accept back then, um, that what he says in the movie is just like any other day here in 2020. Um, but yeah, anyways, there's just so much praise you can give to Eddie Murphy, but the cast just works so well together. Uh, I think the script is tight. I know the screenwriter for this movie actually is known for his work on Ed Wood. He wrote that movie, and it's a movie about a very similar character, a person who wasn't necessarily great at his craft, but he made his dreams come true, and he pursued it um, to a very tragic end. But all in all, he did pursue his dreams. And it's a very similar story, and you could kind of see some hints of uh, the disaster artist in this movie as well where you see similar themes but the disaster artist while it does have similar themes and does take a very eccentric character 
I feel like Disaster Artist really missed the mark and the movie felt more like it was bullying, making fun of, and teasing the character rather than kind of fleshing them out. Um, and this movie does everything right in terms of giving the character depth, giving the people around him um, reason to empathize with him and to follow him on this journey. And so those are just two examples of how to do it right and how to do it wrong. Um, so yeah, anyways, Dolomite is my name. <laughs> God damn, Dolomite. Great God in heaven, you know Cut. Was it good to shave? Now this next movie, <laughs> it might be kind of weird um, to most people. And I'm not saying, oh, you guys just wouldn't get it. It's a movie thing. It's a cinephile thing. Keep in mind, I don't really want to consider myself a cinephile. I feel like I am learning more about movies every day and I'm continuing to learn more about film. Um, and there are so many classic movies that I have not seen, so many weird, weird movies that I have missed that have completely flown under my radar. And movies that I recognize are weird and I'm just too scared to touch them. But this movie, I feel like it's kind of like an entryway into just the absurd. And Under the Silver Lake stars Andrew Garfield. It's a movie that feels very David Lynch, Lynchian. It feels very strange and euphoric. I guess that's a word you could use. It feels like you are being taken to La La Land, um, Hollywood, and you're seeing the seedy underbelly and you're seeing this mysticism being introduced. Now, I'm not describing the movie at all, and I think that's a good thing. And I think it's a very surprising movie that if you go watch, um, you're gonna have a very unique experience. You'll either hate it or you'll love it or you'll feel very in the middle. This movie takes the dirt under Hollywood's fingernails, kind of examines it and kind of puts it under this lens of what if there was something deeper than just bad people with a lot of money producing movies? What if it was actually kind of linked to something scarier? What if all these ties kind of came back to one thing? What if it was a cult? What if there was these different elements that are just so strange and outlandish, no one would ever believe you if you found out? It kind of goes into that. And I am describing this terribly. I honestly don't know how I can just describe a movie like this off the top of my head. I think it's nearly impossible. I just think you should watch it. It's a movie I really appreciated, not because Andrew Garfield finally gets to do something different. Um, but it was a movie that kind of flipped everything that I knew about movies and said, hey, like, a movie can be like this. It doesn't have to always just be structured like this. Uh, you can go in weird ass directions, but still feel uh, consistent. And I don't know, I think I didn't put on my top 10 because I don't even know how to necessarily, you know, convince people to watch it. Uh, I just know that I got something out of it. I felt something out of it. Uh, I was entertained, I laughed. Um, there's a scene where he gets high off his mind and it's just one of the trippiest scenes I've ever watched in a movie. Um, so, I don't know, a lot to like about the movie, very hard to describe, but Under the Silver Lake was a great movie. And also, it had a weird release where I think it was released the year prior, but then because of some things, it got delayed and then it got released and I think it got put out on Amazon and people are pretty harsh with their criticism on this movie. I think people gave it like one or two stars um, and I'm not saying that they missed the point. They have every right to do that. Um, but I think there's a lot more in this movie than people are giving it. So, Under the Silver Lake. Under the Silver Lake. What I love about Nicole, she is a mother who plays, really plays. What I love about Charlie, he loves being a dad. He loves all the things you're supposed to hate, like waking up at night. She knows when to push me and when to leave me alone. He never lets other people keep him from what he wants to do. Dad, you're too far. I know. It's not easy for her to close a cabinet. He's incredibly neat. She's brave. He's brilliant. She's He's very, very competitive. competitive. 
Marriage Story is a movie that really does hit home. Uh, there's a lot of things that I found familiar and I recognize in my own life because of that. Um, and there's just a lot of things that you can get out of this movie. Uh, but most of all, it's a very performance driven movie. There is some story there, but it's just looking at marriage, just looking at the CD underbelly of what marriage is and what divorce is and how much it can just be a torrential downpour of just guilt and shame and make you feel terrible for what you have to do in court to fight for the things that you love. And, um, and it can tear two people apart from each other who honestly, they just were growing apart. And, but in court, that doesn't hold up and you have to say things about the person that you've known to love and sadly that love has gone away, but you have to say things about them that you don't necessarily mean. And you have to distort the truth to kind of shape this narrative in court that could utterly defeat the other person. And in the end, both people are miserable, dissatisfied, and no one really does get what they want and they just end up poorer than they were before. So, not saying that's why I didn't put on my top 10, but it's just a movie for me where I will watch it again. It's just, I don't know, something, something about the movie. I feel like, you know, some of the drama was kind of built up and I do think that there's a specific scene in this movie that is getting a lot of hate on Twitter or whatever. And I think it's totally undeserved and I'll kind of get in, into it later, but I just feel like this movie for me isn't something that I'm going to want to revisit all the time out of entertainment value. It's not necessarily one of my favorites, but it's a movie that is just really great on all ends of the spectrum. So yeah, it's hard. It's hard to describe, but you know, a top 10 is kind of your favorite. It's movies that you want to revisit. It's movies that you want to re-examine. Um, for me, at least, that's my definition. So by that definition, Marriage Story sadly did not make the cut. But let's talk about that scene in the movie, the iconic argument scene. And I used to defend you. They were absolutely right. All your best acting is behind you. You're back to being a hat. You gaslighted me. Just some background on the characters and given the context of the characters in the movie, they are two people that come from a dramatic background. He's a director, she's an actress. Obviously, things are gonna be dialed up and the way that they go at each other seems like you know, they're hitting these beats, they're hitting their marks, and it feels like a stage play. But I really feel like that's kind of adding to each other's characters. They don't know how else to communicate other than being bombastic and being loud and using specific language to get at each other. Um, but I don't know, that's just my take on it, and I think that the acting was really good. I think there was just one part of the scene that kind of fell flat for me, which was when he it, it, it's just, you can tell that Adam Driver is trying to hit his mark. Uh, he's trying to hit the wall at a specific part and it feels just like it kind of slows down uh, the ramping of that tension in that scene. Uh, but that's just like a minor nitpick. And honestly, Twitter's known for ripping everything apart that they don't like and not really examining things. So just revisit that scene with that context and maybe you'll think of it differently. Maybe you'll still hate it, whatever. Or maybe you loved it. So, hey, fuck me, right? If we start from a place of reasonable, and they start from a place of crazy, when we settle, we'll be somewhere between reasonable and crazy. Um, so yeah, that, that's my honorable mentions, right? Yeah, that's it. I put Yesterday on here. I don't know why I put Yesterday on here. That movie was a B minus at best. So, whatever. Um, yeah, so guys, Let's get in my top 10. 